Hello, I'm Judah Sher, an application engineer at GoEngineer, and today I'm going to show you how I optimized this controller holder for FDM 3D printing. The reason I designed this holder is that when I would play games with just a single switch controller, my hands would cramp up after just a few minutes of play. This was because, unlike most modern game controllers, a single switch controller has no handles to grip tightly. To fix this, I scanned this two controller holder, reverse engineered the grip part, and then designed a new set of features to hold a single controller. Now an important part of designing any product is to make sure that it's optimized for whatever processes are going to be used to manufacture it. Broadly speaking, this is called DFM, or Design for Manufacturing. Now, when the process is some form of 3D printing, it becomes DFAM, or Design for Additive Manufacturing. Let me show you how I applied some DFAM principles to this controller holder. This is one of the first versions of this controller holder. One feature that I'm really proud of is how pressing these parts hit the very small buttons on the controller. This motion is achieved by the twisting of these thin parts here, creating a rotating joint. This is an example of what's called a living hinge, which through flexing allows a part to move as if there was a joint between two separate parts. Some common examples of this you've probably seen before are plastic buckles and small containers with hinging lids. Living hinges are great because they require no assembly, are frictionless, and they have built-in spring return. Now, the trick to designing a good living hinge is to make sure you're not flexing the material more than it can withstand so it doesn't permanently deform or even break. Since these shoulder buttons don't need to move far, a living hinge works quite well here. I tried to also use a living hinge for this feature here that keeps the controller in place, but unfortunately in most of my controllers this part would break. So why did my part break here but not at the shoulder buttons? It didn't need to flex anymore, and the material is actually thicker. Well, here's where the DFAM comes in. FDM prints are what's called non-isotropic. That is to say that they have different properties when measured in different directions. The reason for this is that FDM parts are printed one layer at a time. So while each individual layer behaves like a single piece of plastic, the bonds between the layers aren't quite as strong. Because of this, when a force is applied across a layer like it is here, it is pretty strong. But when you stack small layers and then try to bend that part, it is more likely to break. Next, let's look at how this part was printed with support structures. Anytime you have an area that is suspended in midair, the printer needs to print additional structures to hold the part during printing. Since these support structures use material, add printing time, take time to remove, and risk leaving marks behind on your part where they connected, minimizing them is usually a good idea. For this part, I accomplish this in a few different ways. First, it's important to know your printer's self-supporting angle. This is the angle at which a face can be printed without needing supports. In GrabCAD print, this is measured as the angle from the build plate to the face, so usually the higher the angle, the greater number of faces needs to be supported, resulting in longer print times and greater material usage. This was printed with the self-supporting angle set to 30 degrees, so anything at a 30 degree angle to the build plate or greater would not need supports. This meant that by adding these tapered holes, which were also needed to accommodate this part of the controller, I removed large areas that would otherwise have needed to be supported. I also added these chamfered faces here to further reduce the supports around those edges. Finally, I added these tapered areas and blended them into the grip. These don't speed up the printing time since they actually use more material than the support structures, but they do reduce the need for support structures to support the grip, and supports can be especially difficult to remove cleanly from curved surfaces. This initial design worked okay, but it had some issues. This part, which is supposed to keep the controller in place, never really did a great job, even when it didn't just break off. Then there's the issue of seams. Now, these are marks left on each layer where the printing starts, and they can give the grip an uncomfortable texture. Finally, the weight of the whole thing was just too light. It made it feel cheap. There are some controllers out there with adjustable weights in them, and the heft they have is really nice. Taking all that into account, I designed this. This new design holds the controller better, has no visible seam marks, and can be printed with almost no supports, and even has adjustable weights in the grips. First, let's look at how this new design holds the controller. After experimenting with different solutions, I ended up going back to a living hinge design, except this time I did it correctly. The flexing is now done across the layers instead of perpendicular to them, so it's as strong as solid plastic would be. Also, by making the arm very long, the hinge has a greater range of motion before it starts to permanently deform. Next, you'll notice that I added these swooping cut features to the grips. 
This is actually a sneaky DFAM technique to hide seams. You see, slicing software will try to locate seams at sharp interior corners because it knows that this is where they will be the least visible. By adding this cut to the grip, I've given each layer the cut passes through a sharp interior corner. So now all the seams are in there instead of elsewhere on the grip's surface. Probably the most noticeable change I made was that now, instead of printing the whole holder as a single part, it is separated into four different sections. There are several advantages to this, but one of the main ones is that it can now be printed with almost no support structures. By slicing the part at the plane where the controller sits, that face, which had been the main feature needing supports, is now directly on the build surface. Most other places where there are overhangs taper using a self-supporting angle as before, such as these recesses here for holding a small nut. This separation of parts also allowed me to add a completely new feature. Hidden under the tops of the grips are these two screws. If I pull one out, you can see that it has five nuts on it. The combination of these screws and nuts not only adds the heft I was missing before, but also makes the weight highly adjustable by adding or removing nuts or even entire screws from the grip. So far, I've been focusing on how design for additive manufacturing has limited my choices. However, another important part of DFAM is recognizing how it opens up the possibilities of what you can do. Unlike most processes with 3D printing, complexity is free. So as a designer, you can add as many bells and whistles as you'd like. Speaking of which, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this design. Comment down below with ideas of features you would add to a controller holder. And if they're cool enough, I might just add them to the next iteration of this design. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this video. I'll be making lots more, so if you have ideas of other things you'd like to see, comment down below with those as well. As always, please visit GoEngineer.com for access to professional training, upcoming events, and more from your number one online technical resource. Catch you later.